Welcome to Booker T and W.E.B. Part 1, an interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. In this two-part tutorial, you'll learn about the lives, words, and ideas of two of the most important and remarkable African-American leaders in U.S. history, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. They were complicated men. Both lived and worked during the same time period. Both were educators and writers, and both devoted their lives to improving the conditions of black Americans. But as you'll learn, their ideas were otherwise very different, and the two men were ultimately more rivals than friends. Let's begin by placing Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois in their historical context. Their combined lifetimes spanned over a century, from 1856 to 1963, an epic period in American history. Washington was born in 1856 before the Civil War, the conflict that split the United States and ended slavery. Three years after the war's end, Du Bois was born. Washington would die in 1915, but Du Bois would live until 1963, almost two decades after the end of World War II. Both men rose to national prominence during a period historians sometimes call the nadir of American race relations. The start and end dates of this period are not exact, but most historians would agree that it lasted from about 1890 to 1920, or longer. Nadir means lowest point, and for most African Americans, this was a particularly low period of political oppression and Jim Crow segregation. The post-Civil War period known as Reconstruction had ended in a failure to guarantee equal rights or security for most black citizens. Lynchings were frighteningly common, and for black men and women in America, violence was an ever-present threat. It was against the backdrop of the nadir period that Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois both became, in different ways, leaders of their race and two of the most famous intellectuals in America. We'll begin by exploring the early life of Booker T. Washington in detail. Washington was born a slave in Virginia in 1856. Born five years before the Civil War, he was part of the last generation of African Americans born into slavery. He was simply called Booker growing up. Like most slaves, he had no middle or last name by birth. Booker never knew his father, but he was rumored to be a white man who lived nearby. Here are his recollections of his slave childhood in his own words. I was born in a typical log cabin about 14 by 16 square feet. In this cabin I lived with my mother and a brother and sister. The cabin was not only our living space, but was used as the kitchen for the plantation. My mother was the plantation cook. The cabin was without glass windows. It had only openings in the side which let in the light and also the cold, chilly air of winter. There was no wooden floor in our cabin, the naked earth being used as a floor. Meals were gotten to the children very much as dumb animals get theirs. It was a piece of bread here and a scrap of meat there. It was a cup of milk at one time and some potatoes at another. Booker was nine when the Civil War ended in 1865. When Union troops occupied his region of Virginia, he and his mother were declared free under the Emancipation Proclamation. They moved to West Virginia, where they were reunited with Washington Ferguson, Booker's mother's husband, although not his father. Booker adopted his stepfather's name as his last name, and Talia Farrow, a name his mother gave him, as his middle name. Like virtually all African Americans who had been slaves, young Booker T. Washington was illiterate and had never attended school. So he taught himself to read and write. Only then did he go to school for the first time, where he proved an excellent student. With money he had earned from coal mining and other manual labor, he traveled back to Virginia at age 16 to be one of the first students to attend Hampton Institute, a school established specifically to educate freedmen, former slaves like Washington. After graduating, Washington taught at the school, and in 1881, at age 25, he traveled to Tuskegee, Alabama, on the recommendation of Hampton's president to be the principal of a brand new school for black teachers there. The school Booker T. Washington took over in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1881 was initially called the Tuskegee Normal School for Colored Teachers. Its first classes were taught in rooms borrowed from a nearby church. But within a year, Washington had purchased 100 nearby acres that had once been part of a plantation, and he started to supervise the construction of a proper campus. The buildings would be designed and built by Tuskegee's black teachers and students, and by the turn of the 20th century, the Tuskegee Institute, as it would be known, would sprawl over more than 2,000 acres. The institute would become Washington's life's work. 
he would lead it until his death, and he was an energetic, hands-on principal, attending to every detail of campus life in Tuskegee, the faculty, the student body, the coursework, even the grounds and buildings. He lived on the school's grounds in a home he called the Oaks. Washington strived to bring the best black educators in the country to teach at Tuskegee, not only for the money, he said, but also their deep interest in the race. One of the most famous was George Washington Carver, a botanist or plant scientist, who was recruited by Booker T. Washington to head the school's agriculture department. At Tuskegee, where he taught for 47 years, Carver introduced innovative methods of crop rotation designed to improve the health of southern soil that had been overused and depleted by growing cotton. Late in his career, Carver became nationally famous in his own right for his research into soybeans, sweet potatoes, and especially peanuts. He invented more than 300 new uses for the peanut, including peanut-based cosmetics, glue, shampoo, and rubber. Booker T. Washington's views on education were shaped by his strong belief in African-American self-reliance. He considered his own life to be a prime example of how someone could start with nothing but achieve great things through work and education. He expected others to be able to do the same. Living as he did during the nadir of race relations, Washington did not believe that black citizens would soon enjoy full citizenship or live side by side as equals with their white neighbors. Instead, he promoted the idea that success for his race would be largely self-defined. It would need to come from hard work, clean living, and moral discipline. Washington said that African Americans must live what he called exemplary lives, and in doing so, they would carve out their own space in American life. Washington was less interested in education for education's sake than he was with practical results and real-world success. So, in addition to core subjects, a Tuskegee education strongly emphasized vocational skills, or those that would lead directly to a job. Construction, brick-making, and farming for men, and cooking, weaving, and soap-making for women. Tuskegee students made the brooms, chairs, baskets, and rugs they used every day at their school. Religious worship was required on a daily basis. Under Washington's leadership, the Tuskegee Institute was considered to be the center of black education in the United States, and Washington himself was considered the leading African-American figure in the nation in the last decades of his life. Harvard College bestowed on him an honorary degree, even though he had never attended school there. While always continuing as the head of Tuskegee, Washington traveled widely, spoke often in public, and made many friends with powerful connections. He positioned himself at the center of a network of black professionals, educators, ministers, editors, and businessmen that spanned the country. They spread Washington's ideas and supported his school, and he in turn supported them with his influence. Washington had his critics. They called his network the Tuskegee Machine, as if he was operating his own African-American version of an urban political machine. Remarkably for a black man in the Jim Crow era, Washington also enjoyed access to some of the wealthiest and most influential figures in white America. Some of them called Washington their good friend. Many of them donated their money, time, and prestige to black causes that Washington championed or to the Tuskegee Institute directly. These men included Henry Huddleston Rogers, one of the leaders of Standard Oil, George Eastman, founder of the Eastman Kodak Camera and Film Company, and especially Julius Rosenwald, president of Sears and Roebuck department stores. All three men were worth billions by today's dollars. Rosenwald, in partnership with Washington, spent over $4 million of his own fortune to help build almost 5,000 schools for black students across the South. Because he was seen as the spokesman for his race, Washington received a degree of respect from mainstream America unprecedented for a black man. In 1898, President William McKinley became the first of several presidents to make an official visit to the Tuskegee Institute, where he was greeted by Washington himself. And in 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt officially invited Washington to dine with him at the White House. The dinner actually generated such controversy for Roosevelt that he never repeated the invitation officially, but he continued to maintain a warm relationship with Washington. Booker T. Washington never ran for office, but with his high public profile, he could not help but become a somewhat political figure. In many ways, especially today, Washington's views on race seem very conservative. His greatest fame coincided with the rise of Jim Crow and the nadir of race relations, but Washington did not use his influence to publicly oppose segregation or insist on expanded civil rights. Always, he downplayed racial anger or division. 
instead he spoke of black and white americans as partners who were essentially to use the language of his era separate but equal washington's remarks upon president mckinley's visit to tuskegee were typical we welcome you all to this spot where without racial bitterness but with sympathy and friendship with the aid of black men and white men with southern help and northern help we are trying to assist the nation booker t washington expressed his beliefs most famously in eighteen ninety five at the atlanta exposition a sort of world's fair for the american south washington was invited to speak on matters of race and he did so to a mostly white audience his speech would become one of the most famous in all of american history he began by acknowledging that one-third of the population of the south is of the negro race no enterprise seeking the material civil or moral welfare of this region can disregard this element of our population and reach the highest success in other words african americans were an important part of the south and were tied to its destiny he then went on to retell the history of black americans after the civil war ignorant and inexperienced it is not strange that in the first years of our new life reconstruction we began at the top instead of the bottom that a seat in congress or the state legislature was more sought than real estate or industrial skill that the political convention or stump speaking had more attraction than starting a dairy farm no race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem it is at the bottom of life we must begin and not the top nor should we permit our grievances to overshadow our opportunities washington next used a powerful metaphor to describe the situation of black americans in the south a ship lost at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel from the mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen the signal water water we die of thirst the answer from the friendly vessel at once came back cast down your bucket where you are the captain of the distressed vessel at last heeding the injunction cast down his bucket and it came up full of fresh sparkling water from the mouth of the amazon river to those of my race who depend on bettering their condition in a foreign land or who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the southern white man who is their next-door neighbor i would say cast down your bucket where you are cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded in other words black americans were the thirsty travelers on the ship lost at sea their white neighbors were the friendly vessel and the south presumed to be hostile territory was actually full of fresh sparkling water if only african americans would cast down their bucket and take advantage of it by this washington meant hard honest work when it comes to business pure and simple it is in the south that the negro is given a man's chance in the commercial world washington continued the metaphor to those of the white race who look to the incoming of those of foreign birth and strange tongue and habits for the prosperity of the south here he refers to immigrant labor i would repeat what i say to my own race cast down your bucket where you are cast it down among the eight million negroes whose habits you know cast it down among these people who have without strikes and labor wars tilled your fields cleared your forests built your railroads and cities and brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth you will find that they will buy your surplus land make blossom the waste places in your fields and run your factories here washington urges white southerners to employ black men and women and recognize their hard work there was little idealism in washington's speech nor did he call to end social segregation or jim crow in all things that are purely social we can be as separate as the fingers yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress it was another powerful metaphor black and white americans were to remain separate like fingers yet work together like part of the same hand booker t washington's atlanta exposition address was one of the key moments of his celebrated life it was received positively by most white americans among black americans the reaction was far more mixed most supported washington's message of hard work resulting in success but others questioned many of his premises and found them disturbing why was washington so quick to dismiss black civil rights or even the idea that blacks deserved equal rights was he being naive when he depicted white southerners as welcoming and helpful to hard-working african americans the segregation disrespect and even violence surrounding them every day suggested a different reality some other black leaders and intellectuals criticized washington's approach and even went as far to label him a sellout one of them was w e b du bois it's been a pleasure learning with you so far this isn't the end of the story but it is the end of part one of this tutorial in part two you'll learn more about w e b and his rivalry with washington see you soon